is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering what we do in the shadows. Season two, episode two, Ghosts. In this episode, it turns out that the blood sucking vampires all have ghosts of themselves hanging around with unfinished business. And we get to see how they interact with their own ghosts. And honestly, it's like kind of what you would expect, I think. (laughs) Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Max for commissioning this episode. What's up, Max? Um, Yeah, it turns out it's the same Max who's commissioning Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. And I didn't realize, I thought we had two different Maxes because they came from two different emails. And now I'm just blown away. Max is just like out here commissioning everything. So I am so excited that this show didn't die because I... You know, there were no episodes commissioned when I finished the last one, um, the start of season two. And that was the last one. And I was just like, oh, man, I can understand with something that isn't like plot driven, that maybe it wouldn't feel as urgent to people to to commission the next episode. I completely get it. But personally, I enjoy this being so not plot heavy. It's like a bit of a break for me in the way that I normally think about whatever it is that I'm covering, where I'm trying to sort of see ahead about what might happen. Or I'm like, you know, growing worried about certain characters because of what might go on with them in a very like final way. And I also can, like, It can get a little heavy. A lot of plot-driven shows can deal with some subject matter that's a bit much. And it's just nice to have something that's, like, fun, you know? And this show can be a little bit dark sometimes, but it's just always, like, delightful about it. I'm sort of waiting for the episode that falls flat for me. I haven't really come across one yet. There's, like, been a couple episodes where... I didn't think it was as funny as some of the others. I maybe saw the jokes coming a little bit more. But overall, there hasn't been a stinker yet. And that's a really tough thing for any comedy to pull off. And this show, this episode, there's so much about this that I love. So we start off and we are with Laszlo and he's in the library. And he is, he like hears a noise and he looks over And he doesn't see anything, looks back at the desk that he's writing on, and then hears another noise and turns back again. And he sees all of the books stacked up in the way that, like, you know, it's a horror movie sort of trope of, like, um, books getting stacked up or all the frames falling off the wall or furniture being stacked is another pretty popular one. And then there's, you know, the whole um, sixth sense with every single uh, cabinet door open. That is one of the things that I remember the most. Six, there, there are some things that I think aren't actually as scary, but for some reason can get under folks' skin. And we each have a different one that sort of gets to us a little bit. But for me, some somehow, when the camera goes like away and comes back and all of the cabinet doors are open in sixth sense. I remember gasping and like kind of jumping a little bit. And that's not, it's, I don't know if it's like really supposed to be quite a jump scare, but it felt like it was, you know, and this whole like arranging things in such a way when we find out I'm, I, I am assuming that this is all being done by Gregor I wish this is the only thing that the episode sort of missed an opportunity for, for me. I wish that we got to see how Gregor can do things like this so fast because it looks like in the afterlife, 
or not even, I don't know if you can call it the after, like, I guess it's the afterlife. Is it though, if you're like still a ghost and you're not actually, you haven't left, like moving on to the afterlife is what's going on, right? Anyway, I, they all seem to move at the same pace and do the same things that they like in the same ways. And I'm very curious about like, you know, how that sort of mechanic works because he moves faster than the vampires do and startles Laszlo so bad. And um, Laszlo jumps to this like completely, there's no rationality behind this assumption whatsoever. But we have Guillermo walking in with uh, Nandor behind him. And I should mention, Nandor looks like, or not Nandor, Guillermo looks really ticked off as he's walking in. There's this sort of vibe that he's really over it lately. And I, for one, fully support Guillermo just starting to be like, I'm not... I just don't want to play this game the same way anymore. Like it clearly has not been working for me. So I may as well come to my fucking senses. And I was sort of like wondering how that was going to manifest this episode. It's like a subtle pushback about the ghost thing. And that's kind of all we get, but it was enough for me. And also I really like, and, and this might be part of why I thought this episode worked so well. This episode, they don't leave the house. And it's only our guys, you know, it's only the people that we are here for, our, our misfit crew. And that, like, it's not, that's not the same that when they have guests on that that's not fun. You guys know I love that. I mean, the finale of the last season with all of these different guests was so great and so full of surprises and weirdness and Tilda Swinton. But when you get everybody just sort of like boxed up together, this is the good stuff. You know, I really, this is what I want to sink my teeth into. And usually when they bring on guests, it, the, the comedy gets a little spread out in such a way that it makes total sense and like works within the episode, but they don't get a lot of time to like inquire about things the way that they are able to this episode when they are, figuring out what the hell is going on with ghosts. So he, Guillermo comes in and Nandor says that it's Guillermo who piled all of his books up, which like, first of all, no human could move that fast. Guillermo was literally not even in the room, sir. And why would he? Like, there's just no reason to think that. But because Guillermo is just here to be a fucking whipping boy for everybody, that is immediately what is jumped to. Um, so <laughs> I love this. When Nandor is, or um, Laszlo is like, oh, really? You didn't do it? Then explain this. And he opens the library door again. This is when all of the furniture is piled up on top of each other. And Nandor, Guillermo, why would you do such a thing? Oh my god, these two. This, I will get back to this, but I really love this so much. So at this point, a drawer just opens on its own. And there is a... <laughs> there is a scroll in there that says, Laszlo sucks backward. To which Laszlo says, bullshit, I don't suck. And if I did, I certainly wouldn't do it backward. <laughs> I have to disagree with you on that one, Laszlo. It seems to me you're pretty much up for anything. And I am would be like utterly shocked to hear that you don't suck, first of all. And secondly, if you didn't do it backwards, like that would just sort of undermine my idea of you as being somebody who's sort of just always game. So I really, you know, personally, I think that uh, he is protesting too much here. I'm just saying that sounds like Laszlo to me, like sucks backwards 100%. Sure. Um, 
So Nadja here says we have ghosts. And it turns out that nobody else like believes in ghosts except for Guillermo because he has some fucking sense. But when Laszlo disagrees with her and she asks like, okay, well then how do you explain it then? He makes this amazing, I'm going to read this like verbatim. Uh, first he says, she also thinks goblins are real. Personally, I'm a man of science. And then he says, I, it can be one of two things. One, a mercurial zephyr. Two, it's a farrago of gases, possibly from a peat bog. If you capture these and add them together using yellow bile from a plague victim, you've got what looks like a ghost, but it's science. I... I really, guys, desperate to know, and I've said this before, I'm desperate to know what parts of this show are scripted and what are improvised, because there is something about that that felt like it was partially improvised. And like, I'm guessing that the mercurial Zephyr and Farrago of gases are probably like in the script. But there is something about the, you know, mix it with the bile of a plague victim that felt like he was just pulling that one out of his ass. And I can't tell if it's because he's actually doing improv, or if it's because he's so good at portraying Laszlo as being full of shit. You know what I mean? It's just great. I just love these two so much. Um, so then we go to Nandor, who is saying that ghosts are fairy tales and they're a thing that we just like tell kids about in order to frighten out their excess energy so that they might slumber more peacefully. And off to the side, Guillermo just says, huh, did you say something? I'm sorry. Vampires are real, but ghosts are not. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is the kind of thing that can drive me fucking crazy in so much like supernatural fiction. The author has these characters who are set up to believe in like bonker shit, shit that does not make any sense. And then they will, there will be something that's just like bonkers in a different way. And all of a sudden, they are talking about how that's like not possible. Why not? There's literally no reason why not. If you believe in all this other, like, you know, that's sort of what works about Game of Thrones is that magic feels like it is gone. And the like, b b dragons being back begins to like, it affects actual magic for sure, and is causing like actual magic to seem to return as well. But there's the other aspect of it, which is that once people are like seeing dragons, they start to believe in other stuff being real in a different way because they just assumed that this was all like historical shit that we would never see again. But yeah, there are so many like, especially like kind of bad network TV shows where there'll be like dragon or dragons, uh, vampires, werewolves, whatever. And then they'll pull something else out. And like, look, I will be honest there have been times where they will pull out a new creature that they haven't had on the show before or in the book. And I will personally be like, all right, this has gone a little bit too far, but that's a different thing than the characters in world, not believing that it is a possible thing. Do you get what I'm saying? So like, for example, me being tired of something or thinking they went too far, a really good example of that is, is true blood when they decided to introduce fairies to the storyline i don't think so no 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 i don't think so um so <laughs> i just really appreciated guillermo being like the voice of reason on this i love the concept of a creature that they don't believe in too because like i expected the we have ghosts to be greeted with the sort of attitude that people have when they find out they have mice or worse, like maybe uh, 
bug bed bugs. And I really just thought this was going to be sort of like a routine. We need to like tent the house and gas it, you know, and instead the fact that they don't believe in it just took it in a much different direction that I found like a little surprising and kind of fun. So then we have this uh, like kind of, I don't even want to say a spat. Guillermo is just, you know, really pushing it in a way that he doesn't often do. And this is just more evidence of like the way that he has started to lose respect for his masters. He's in like, Nandor isn't just having a conversation and Guillermo is piping in with his contribution. Nandor is in the middle of like the confessional booth, like interview type thing, because within this universe, they have acknowledged that they are doing a documentary. So it's like a step beyond just interrupting a conversation. He is like worming his way into part of the narrative that Nandor has held exclusively for himself without asking permission and not just to add to it, but to contradict him. It's a whole vibe that I am here for. I am loving this. And like, we needed it. We really did. I'm feeling like this is something that maybe he and Nadja are going to wind up like kind of seeing eye to eye at some point or more eye to eye. It's hard for me because I can never really get a handle on how Nadja feels about like human people. You know, there are times where they don't seem to mean anything to her. And then there's like, you know, when she turned that college girl and seemed to really like her and take her under her wing, but then she just like left her again and we haven't seen her. I'm really wondering what she's up to, by the way. But yeah, I'm just sort of curious about like the potential of the two of them connecting over the stupid men in the house. So, and then we have the whole thing with, um, uh, <laughs> Him talking about, I was, <laughs> guys, this is so good. I, I'm, I'm still on the, I'm still on Guillermo contradicting him. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. You know, after years of working for you, a known vampire, I have seen werewolves, necromancers, a zombie, and several Babadooks, but a ghost. That's where we draw the line. Several? You saw one Babadook. Several, but don't exaggerate. Guys, can I just tell you how like real that moment was for me? I mentioned this on the show. I think I mentioned it on like Song of Ice and Fire. It might have been Dresden, but I was talking to Rashawn and I was talking about how uh, Owen and I got in, in an argument because I said that like he hadn't washed the pillow I got him since I bought it. And that was three years ago. And instead of just acknowledging that it was still too long to have gone without washing a thing. Owen fixated on the fact that no, it was actually two years and four months. It was not three years. Ex essentially the don't exaggerate thing and making me defend my like slight exaggeration of the time. Instead of thinking about the overall message here, which is that it hasn't been washed that whole time. It's gross. It It's that's all. That's all it is. It's just, you know, but this kind of like nitpicking amongst people when they're arguing with each other, I just, it's so real. And it's so, he completely sidesteps the actual question. That's exactly what the point of nitpicking like this is. And you can see this in like Facebook comments and stuff too. Like when people begin to argue with one another about stuff, there'll be somebody who they are aware that they are on the losing side or they're aware that they don't actually like have a good answer to a question that's been posed to them. And so instead of like responding or, you know, creating any like rational response that feels like it's related to the subject, they zero in on like kind of a throwaway part of the sentence that was not technically correct or true. And they try to use that to like discredit the entire point. And it's so fucking frustrating because this is my problem, guys. I fall for that shit all the time because it's like I want to believe that the person's like 
asking in good faith or you know what I mean? So I will just definitely like take the bait of talking about the other thing. And so the whole thing with Owen and him talking about how it wasn't actually three years, it was only two, like two years and like four months, or it was longer than four months even. But instead of me doing the, and is that not gross for you to have gone that long without washing it? Instead, it became, that's close enough. That was, it was me trying to like defend the point that mattered least just because he was really good at needling me and going, well, you were wrong, though. But you were wrong. You were wrong, though. And it's just so effective and annoying. And I hate it so much. <laughs> so then we have Colin. And I was really curious what he was going to say about believing in ghosts or not, I kind of thought he would believe in them like out of the gate and be like, Oh, yeah, they're definitely real. And then like, so he says no. And says that he's skeptical. And guys, I just have to mention to the look of this moment. He is in one of those sort of odd armchairs that has like, the curved roof to it that comes up over the back of it, which I assume was built so th to like keep heat in, you know, um, position one of those like in front of a fireplace and it's going to become this lovely little like cocoon of heat. And I've seen these for sale places and they're just gorgeous, but they would never fit with like my home's vibe, you know. Um, but his is beige and his <laughs> collared shirt is beige and the cable knit sweater over the collared shirt is beige and it's a really great like the the contrast of like the incredibly dramatic design of the chair but then the really fucking bland color scheme for it and everything I feel like that's just genius. I love it so much. Um, and then he does the whole, maybe it's ghosts that are always stealing a sock from the dryer. I've always, I've been experimenting with the uh, humor to drain energy, which reminds me, does anyone here have any up dog? Up dog? Uh, guys, this is a go, this, is an ongoing bit. This moments like this make me go, okay, did one of the writers spend time around somebody who did shit like this? And they were like, Oh, this is perfect for Colin Robinson. I am definitely going to have to take this idea and run with it because this is exactly shit that would like, because holy shit, have you ever been around a person who does this kind of thing? They tell like really predictable or tired jokes. And it's not the same as dad jokes. Dad jokes are, like, delightfully goofy, you know? They're the kind of thing that, like, maybe you know what they're about to do, but usually they're told when you've sort of let your guard down and they catch you with a little, like, silly pun. This is somebody who, like, the best comparison that I can make is it, you get somebody who has spent some time around a person telling these jokes and for them, the person that you're dealing with, these feel new, you know, they, and, and they feel still really clever because that person had not dealt with it all before. And so they come at you with this energy, like they think they're going to impress you or something. And it's just like, sweetie, no, I, I, of course I already hurt, you know? And that for me is always like so tough because you, the only way to sort of deal with it is to either not, not reply, which is what most of them do with the updog thing. Although it turns out, I thought that they were like purposely ignoring it because they knew what it was. But we find out later with Nandor that he genuinely does not know where, what it is and so he sort of like at the end of the episode like goes for it but doesn't set him up for the punchline um but yeah you can either just not respond at all 
Or you have to be like, oh, yeah, I've heard that one. It's a good one. Or, yeah, I've heard that one. And just leave it at that. Don't say that's a good one because maybe it's just really not. And (laughs) it's always, it's like somebody sending you a meme and being really excited about it. But you saw this meme and sending a meme that you've already seen, no sin at all. Look. We're all in a different meme series of pages. We all have different, like, you know, some of us are on Facebook, some of us are on Twitter, some of us are on Discord. We all get our memes in different places, Reddit, wherever. So you're going to see things at different times. But when you get a meme that's like years old, you guys know, it just feels like so sad. You're just like, oh, babe, this is the thing. This is new. You must be on the old shit. You got to catch up. What is this? This felt extremely effective. It's almost like being around a little kid who got like a joke book. But oftentimes, those joke books for kids are full of fucking bangers. Let's be honest. They are really, really funny sometimes, like, truly. So I don't even like to make that comparison, really. Um, (laughs) Anyway, um, this is just... It, it, it reoccurs all throughout the episode, and it is so cringy every time. I mean, it feels more effective to me, too, somehow, as a viewer, because this is a comedy, to insert really played out, tired comedy for Colin's character I feel like that's a really good idea and it plays very differently than watching him talking about, for example, like going to the DMV or whatever it is that we've seen him kind of coming at people with before, where you can like sort of pass by that as it's happening. And as a viewer, I can understand what that's like in the moment and I can be like, oh yeah, that sucks to be stuck talking to this guy. But it has to be bypassed because for the sake of pacing, you can't just have the camera sit on him and while he's telling that story. But this, we are fucking experiencing the energy drain. It's us. It's like he's feeding off of the audience somehow. And I'm just like, oh man, I hate this. I really hate this so much. Oh God. So we go to the seance. And this is so frustrating. Because Nadja is a complete believer and wants everybody to take it seriously. And all of them think that this is so goofy. And they keep making jokes about it. And Guys, have you ever been in a situation where somebody's taking a thing seriously and other people aren't? Like, maybe you were the person either who was taking it seriously and nobody else was, or vice versa. It is so frustrating to be the one that wants everybody to, like, stop and pay attention and really believe this thing. I felt for her so much in this scene because like they, they're just feeding off of each other, you know, and it's just, Oh, it's so frustrating to watch. I really hated it. Um, so (laughs) she does her chanting and does the thing where she like starts singing a little bit. And then we hear a creaking and it starts them off on joking around that, the uh, ghosts are farting. The ghost has IBS. Maybe you summoned a breakfast burrito, etc., etc. Completely ruining the vibe because they all start giggling. And she is like, you guys have fucked it up when we have been trying to communicate and there will be a price paid for that. And it's not like she's saying, I'm like, I'm going to make you pay the price. She's just like sort of insinuating that like the ghosts are going to fucking do something, man. That's they're not going to stand for this. And she like goes out to sit on the front steps by herself. And there is Gregor with his fucking head in his motorcycle helmet still under his arm. (sighs) Guys, I don't know why. I didn't 
think of Gregor. And I'm so excited that we get him back. I have loved him. You guys know I was like, the payoff for his death was great. I thought it was so well done. But as far as Gregor, like being dead, actually being taken out of play for the show, I was devastated. I did not like, you know, I was trying to even come up with ways that they could bring him back and kept thinking about like him, you know, being because the whole thing is that he keeps being like, uh, born over and over again. And I was like, well, then he would be too young in the way that the story is. We wouldn't see him by the time he grows to be an adult. So they can't do that. A ghost never even entered my mind. And the way that they have done the ghost animation here is really fun. It's like they've just sort of blurred the edges and made the edges like almost looking like... um. <laughs> this is going to sound weird, but the the edges almost remind me of like the screensavers on like Windows way back when. There's like a very sort of 90s energy to the design. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I, I know that that might sound kind of like I'm being like, wow, this is really bad CGI. But honestly, I think it's like kind of charming. I like it. Um, so yeah, eventually he's like talking to her from under his, uh, arm and she has to request that he like put his head back on his neck because it's just gross and weird talking to him from down there. <laughs> I love that so much. So they are going back and forth and he asks her if she will help him with his unfinished business. And I should mention, too, that at this point, she she calls him Jeff. And then she starts calling him Jesk. It's like she corrects herself into Jesk, and he never corrects her out of that. The rest of the episode, she keeps calling him that. I don't know why he doesn't correct her because I feel like he has in the past. Maybe it's because since he remembers himself as Gregor now, that name doesn't matter to him. And so it's just like he doesn't care enough to correct her. But yeah, I love this. So Laszlo comes outside and he says, I'm not sorry for taking, uh, or he says, I'm sorry for not taking you seriously, darling. And I'm, of course, assuming that he's saying that because he sees this fucking ghost sitting here. And then she's like, well, what do you think now? And he's like, when I still think the same thing. And she's like, well, what with him sitting right there? And Laszlo pretends that he can't see the ghost. And you guys, I started to get really upset because what I thought we were doing, I really did. I thought... We were going to have Laszlo be so irritated that his wife was right and he was wrong that he was going to gaslight her by pretending he couldn't see the ghost for maybe like the rest of the episode. And I was about to be very, very mad at him because just, ew. But no, it's a lot more fun than that. He definitely can see him. And it turns out that he kept it to himself so that the ghost would not be prepared for when they got the drop on him. So he goes back inside and he alerts Nandor and uh, comes back out. He's got some, what is it, his sword? Um, Nandor has a sword. Yeah, he takes it off of the wall. And, <laughs> right, where's this fucking ghost? And he just goes pelting out the front door and just yells, get ready to swallow my sword, thrusts into him with like a full sort of leap forward. And of course, because this is a ghost, flies right through him and like winds up sort of belly flopping onto the ground in a very embarrassing display. And I really want to know why Nandor thought... I got to stop asking why Nandor thought. Nandor doesn't function in logic. Nandor is an emotional being. So it makes sense that he wouldn't really, you know, but like, come on, dude, this feels so basic. Um, 
And then Colin comes out and just says, shit, that's wild. In a really sort of like mellow way. It's just he's not phased by it, but he is like excited over it. And I love that Nandor winds up covered in ectoplasm because he went flying through it. And it basically looks like somebody has just emptied several bottles of lotion all over him. This is the kind of thing I always think about what it must have been like for the actor. Like, because it's all over his face, it's all over his hair. And I'm thinking about like costuming as well, because they have him in a a really gorgeous sort of like brocade coat. And they have to, I guess, either use a substance that can be washed out. Or you make a double of whatever it is that you're going to be covering with this, you know, but depending on like the production, especially if they're using like fake blood or something, it can be really hard to wash that shit out. So you kind of have to get it right in the first take or else you've just wasted a bunch of like materials. And he is just like, he looks so gross right here, guys. Really, really gross. So he tells them he's not going to hurt them at, at prompting from Nadja. And they, then he says, I, uh, I'm just here to scare you. And they say, well, we're not scared. And he stands up and he says, how about now? Yanks his head off. And Nandor says, been there, done that. And then how about now? And drops the head forward. And it turns into this like multi-eyed fucking like head of a hell beast. It's got teeth the size of like butter knives. It's, it's quite a lot and it opens its mouth and just screams at them and they completely freak out i love colin does not run away his jacket gets like blown open at the force of the scream and he just sort of stands there and takes it like (sighs) you know so of course nandor and laszlo go running away but colin like takes more of a moment and then turns and says uh, pardon me, ghost. And Gregor says, later, man. Nice meeting you. Oh, my God. Guys, I am just so into Nadja and Gregor. And I am so disappointed in the way that she, like, deals with him this episode. I am not. I Don't get me wrong. I am under no illusion that we have actually seen the last of him. Like, Assuredly not. (laughs) But I wanted her to like figure out a way to interact with him. You know, I mean, later on, Laszlo jerks himself off. It's not like it's not possible. I I'm just saying there's things that could happen. But no, Um, (laughs) without a body, he's all Jesk and no Gregor. And it stinks is the way she says it. I don't know, man. I don't know if I agree with that. We don't actually like she never finds out from Laszlo what happened between him and his own ghost. And I'm wondering if that'll be the thing. If like eventually he'll tell her what it was that was the unfinished business and she'll be like, wait, you were able to do that and it'll change things. But yeah, as of right now, she doesn't seem aware that that can happen at all. So he says he has unfinished business and he needs her help so that he can leave this plane. And she says, sure, what is it you want me to do? And he says, just like, swear that you'll help me. Like, and she says, you know what? I don't have time for this. My husband is shitting himself down the road and she takes off. My question is, is the unfinished business just wanting her to make the promise that she'll help him with his unfinished business. Because that feels like what's sort of like being hinted at here. Um, Cause she never actually like stands and waits for him to fully explain. And I'm kind of wondering if that's all it is. She just has to agree to it and that will be it and it'll be done. But yeah. So Oh my God. We go inside. Colin is helping Nandor get it. All of this like stuff off of him. Colin says, 
It looks a little bit like up dog and everybody completely ignores it. So we talk about what ghosts are. When people die, a spirit is released and that's a ghost. And then Nandor is like, well, we all died. So how can that really be? And then he says, except for Colin. And Colin says, yeah, I'm not positive what my deal is either. So I just sort of keep on trucking. Y'all, I feel like I've like asked that question. But I am so delighted that they're bringing this up. And I feel like this is a real gold mine. I don't know what they're going to do with it. But there's like a lot here, right? And the whole idea of, okay, so he's definitely like not undead because, you know, like I was wondering, is there just a different way that you can become this kind of vampire? But I feel like if there were, he'd remember how that happened to him and he'd remember having had a human life and he doesn't. So is he just born like this? And if he is, I'm not sure that family know that's what's going on because later on his, he's like talking to his grandmother and I thought that she might mention something about their vampirism and she doesn't say anything. So I'm like, does she not know or is it just like not actually that important to her to talk about it? What's, or is like the, her asking him what's going on in his life supposed to be like her version of draining his energy? Like it just, I have so many questions about how that's, works like in Dresden files there are several different courts of vampire and the type of vampires that our friends are here are the red court vampires um which you know like can look very human and are capable of like shape shifting to a degree and then there's black court which are more like what their baron looked like where He's gonna, he can like go out and like sort of act human, but he looks too fucking weird for anybody to get a close look at him and that be safe. And he's a lot more vulnerable to like the traditional garlic and steaks thing. And then there's the white court, and those are like succubi and they are born, they are not made like the black court and red court are. And so I've sort of been going off of this like assumption, I think, with Colin that he functions the same way that like, you know, an energy vampire is born, not made. And to find out that he doesn't even know himself is like, really, that leaves so much open, they could do so much with that. And I'm really like, I'm looking forward to seeing what that might look like. Because just there's a, just a lot of room there, especially considering that he like ran across another type of his kind last season, but she fed on like pity, basically. Is, are they of the same, like, they function so similarly? Is there just a type of energy draining creature and they're all under the same umbrella and they just each have their own type of energy? Or are there pity vampires and maybe fear vampires and maybe anger vampires and maybe, you know what I mean? Like, are how many different types are there? I really, I'm, I'm certain that it was not considered important and that the writers hadn't actually figured it out at the time. But I do really wish that in the episode where he met somebody who was so much like him that he asked them what the deal was. Because if he doesn't know, I would think he'd be like pretty curious about that. But sadly, he doesn't. It's fine. But I am just like extremely, I hope that they follow that thread somewhere. So this is when Laszlo asks, so if all it takes to create a ghost is for you to die, could there be ghosts of us somewhere? And not just immediately starts to be like, no, come on. And then stops and is like, wait and then we cut to another seance in which everybody is taking this shit a lot more seriously it's so good guys she's got like this huge book holder with this giant like hardback book open and fucking crystal balls like she's got like 
six crystal balls there. Um, and all of these candles lit and everything. It's delightful. And then all of a sudden, three ghosts show up. And it is each of them from the moments when they died. And <laughs> Nandor's ghost speaks the language of his, like, you know, homeland. And it turns out our Nandor does not remember how to speak it anymore. Joel, this is tragic to me. I felt so bad. He he calls it embarrassing. And honestly, I feel like that's probably how I would also feel like to realize it would be like sort of heartbreaking to realize I don't remember. But also it would be genuinely like, I can't believe I let that happen. You know, like I just I thought that was such a nice touch, especially he's been alive like so much longer. You know, it makes sense after thousands and thousands of years of not using it that you might just kind of like, well, what's the point anymore? You know, it's a dead people. Um, so <laughs> they each have their time with their ghosts, but it goes so differently for each of them because of like, you know, whether there is a language barrier or whether they are happy with what the other is doing. So I'm going to deal with Laszlo first, since we pretty much already like, you know, talked about that a little bit. But Laszlo's ghost was killed in the midst of jerking off, and he didn't get to come. So he and he says that he's tried like a million times with his little ghost hands to finish the job. And it doesn't work. He can't like grab on to anything. But he thinks that Laszlo's still living human hands, well, kind of living, kind of human hands could do the job. And there is this amazing sort of like, moment between the two of them, where he's asking uh, Laszlo for help and Laszlo makes eye contact with him in such a way that it feels really like there's just a very sort of Loki vibe going on here with because of, you know, just sort of being into himself, you know, and I just love your meat hands, I'm convinced, would give me the traction for sexual release. And then he just wiggles his fingers and looks at him. And for a second, I thought, is Laszlo, uh, like, creeped out by this request? I would be sort of surprised. But I think now, looking back, the expression that he is getting is more like, dare we? Oh, my goodness. You know, that kind of thing of just like, not he's he absolutely would go through with it. But it's just such a sort of forbidden thing. Like, it's me, though, you know, oh, my God, that just, it's so in character, too. And I love the fact that Laszlo's ghost is essentially like delighted with what Laszlo has done as a vampire. Like he has no problems with the direction his life has taken. No issues whatsoever. And then there's Nadja. And Nadja's self is so disgusted with her for not like <laughs> not doing anything with her life. <sighs> this you could have done 1000 things a thousand times, but what have you done? Uh, all you do is sit around this house with these two dumb men just talking about their willies and their assholes. And Honestly, if, if if this is not what many of us have been thinking, I don't know what is. I mean, this is the thing in so many properties that I cover, there will be like a group of dudes and then one female character. And in practically all of them, the one female character is the only like intelligent one that has any sense and the men are all fucking doofuses. And a lot of times it can still work for me as annoying as that trope can get. But I really appreciated it being specifically called out here that like, she could do so much better than this situation. Every time that they go out as a group, you just get such a sense that Nadja is like, 
several tiers above all of these dudes in like the general vampire coolness hierarchy, you know, and they always bring her back down with them because she's and I'm sort of wondering, like, are we going to get to a place where her and Laszlo like split up? Because I wouldn't be mad about it. It would be kind of fun to see like the way that they each deal with it, the way like how they each go about dating or whatever it is that they do. But I feel like it's I really appreciate it being mentioned here. Um, And she says, how can I help you with your unfinished business? And her ghost says, you are my unfinished business. How can I rest until you do something with your eternal life instead of sitting around here like a bump on a log's ass? I should mention, too, that her costume as her ghost self is so beautiful. I just love it so much. So they're in the midst of arguing with one another. And then we get this wonderful moment where they each say the same thing at the same time. And then they start laughing because they heard themselves saying it. And this is like the kind of thing that um, I I like Laszlo has this with his self immediately where there's the, the instantaneous like, oh, yeah, we're like this. And um, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with where you are. You're a good looking man. You've, uh, you know, done some things good for you. And I like that Nadja's thing is like they eventually get to a point where they really enjoy each other. But it takes a minute because her other self is just kind of like, come on, man. And that feels very right to me. There's nobody in this group that I feel like has a sort of relationship with themselves that they would dislike the, their like vampire self. But I would be interested to see how that looked. You know, if your ghost self met you and was gen- genuinely like, wow, this is what you're doing now? You are a real piece of shit. That would be kind of fun to see. But the the thing with Nadja, they wind up... Uh, <laughs> she goes in to find a vessel for the ghost of herself to inhabit. And they find this creepy fucking doll and they put the Nadja's ghost jumps into it, essentially, because she's in the middle of asking, like, does this take like a ritual or anything? And without even like responding, her ghost has already shot into this doll. So (laughs) I really love this, guys. I do. It's just because now this means that this like fucking doll is going to be around and I am absolutely 100% here for it. I really love the idea of a second Nadja in the house, especially because the guys don't know about it. So what is that going to look like? How is she going to talk to this in any way without like drawing their attention? Because it's not like there's that many people in the house, you know? Um, And what, like, can the, I can't remember. Can the doll move around? I feel like the doll was able to move around, right? Yeah. So that'll be fun as well. Like, will she encourage it to creep people out? Or will she be like, you can't keep moving around. They're going to figure something out, you know? Um, And as they're in the middle of laughing at this, Gregor comes in. Uh, Jesk. And... He wants to give her an update on what can be done about his unfinished business. And her ghost self is like, yo, who dat though? Because a damn. And she is right to do so. Even in death, Jesk is very hot. It's kind of annoying, honestly. And present Nadja, vampire Nadja, is like, Girl, don't do it. Don't do it. It is just nothing but pain and heartache. And later on when he comes in again, and this is what reminded me that the doll can indeed move. She's inside the doll and like holds her hand up and is like, give me a call later. And I'm just wondering, is there a way that ghost Jesk and ghost Nadja can maybe hook up? 
You know, like she's in a doll now, but can she just like leave the doll whenever she wants? I don't really know how that goes, but I am very, very here for it. You know, I'm just, look, somebody has to hook up with him. Somebody's got to. We can't have this gorgeous man wandering around on the fringes of everything and nobody hooks up with him. That's just like, oh, what a waste, truly, you know? Ugh. Anyway, then we go to Nandor and his storyline is so like heartbreaking, honestly. It's funny, but also just so sad. So he says that his horse was his best friend and his horse is John. He calls him John, but his ghost calls him by like a similar name, but it's obviously in the original language. Um, and he, let's see, he says, John, I can't, I'm trying to see if in the uh, subtitles they have him, you know, say the, the name in the other language. And actually this brings me to another question. I don't know if any of y'all are listening, but the language that he's speaking, is this meant to be like an actual language or are they just like sort of making it up? Like, I was just curious about what was uh, the deal with that and how real it was. Um, so, oh, and I should mention too, the whole thing with Naja, it ends with her just telling him to like get lost and he does, but he looks really sad about it and it honestly hurt my feelings. So... <laughs> We we find out that Nandor's ghost self wants to see his horse one last time. That's like his unfinished business. And Nandor tells us the story of the horse. He says like the horse was closer to him than any of his wives or children or anybody in his life says I would sometimes feed him nuts and berries from my own mouth. <sighs> Way to make it weird, Nandor. You always do it. You always manage to just like, you know, just you take something that should be kind of adorable and you just take it a little bit too far. Bless him. And so they do a summoning. They do another like seance. It's just him and his ghost and Colin Robinson. And it turns out his horse is dead because poor Nandor wound up in like this position where he had to eat him. And he tells us this story. He says, my army and myself found ourselves stranded with no food. And I wept the entire meal. Even though he tasted delicious. <laughs> And so it's kind of an adorable moment where both his ghost and himself are watching this ghost horse with the same level of like really deep affection, you know? And it's like, honestly, kind of, I don't know. I found it like kind of moving. I just really thought this was so sweet. Um, and Colin is the one, he's in the room and basically is like, I think, because he starts to sort of fade out. And I felt so bad. Nandor is like, where are they going? Because he's so excited to see his horse again, that when they begin to fade away, he's just really, like, losing the horse again, you know? And Colin has to explain, I think that, the, this was his unfinished business. Like, he, so now he's going. And Colin sees him being really heartbroken, walks up to him, taps his arm and says, they're there. And Nandor says, hug. And they actually hug. Even though Colin has a bit of a grimace. And he says, I think you just need a little up dog waiting for Nandor to fall for this. And all Nandor says is, can we get some now? And you see Colin just blink and be so annoyed at the fact that he, like, doesn't 
get know the joke, but he didn't walk into it. And I mean, guys, telling a joke that has that kind of punchline where somebody has to like unintentionally set you up and they they don't know it, but they also don't do it right. Oh, so frustrating. Um, so anyway, the last thing that we get is Colin. And guys, this is so like, oh my God. Colin decides to try and summon his grandmother. And he just does it like I actually don't think he decides to summon her. I think that he just starts reading from the book. It's unclear, but I don't think that he meant for her to show up. And all of a sudden, she's just sitting there. And <laughs> she winds up setting him up. She does it, guys. She says, you've gotten so grown up and so handsome. Probably because I had so much up dog. What's up dog? Nothing much, dog. What's up with you? And he is so delighted to finally get to use this. The look on his face. Oh, my God. And the only thing is about it that he can't feed on her, I'm assuming. You know, nothing like happens. But then she asks, "How? tell me how is your life? I have missed so much. And then he starts behaving as if his grandmother is just like on the phone calling at like a time that's not good for him. And this honestly, guys, it made me really like emotional because as much as this is being played for comedy and it is funny, it just made me think about the number of times that I did respond to like my grandmother or my dad calling with this kind of like blow off attitude. And then they died really suddenly my dad did anyway and how like that the last time i spoke to him was me kind of blowing him off that was like the very last conversation we ever had and then two days later he was dead and so this moment for me was just like oh you know that kind of the the vibe is just and we all do this. There, we can't help but take people for granted in life. It's unfortunate. And you can like love somebody and act and like appreciate them. But to a point, we all just take for granted that the people we love are going to be there tomorrow. Like that's just the way it works. Because if we don't take it for granted, how do you like function, you know? And so he does this whole thing where he, uh, maybe we can catch up another time, but there's so much I want to ask you about. Okay, gotta go. And he just blows the candle out and she disappears and he gets up like it's nothing. And that is the end of the episode. <sighs> Colin, I really do hate you. <laughs> oh God. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There's some chatter here. Uh, did you, the series was not dropped. It's been quite a while. Oh, yeah. And then Ms. T says, I just finished binging season three. And Dr. Hammer says, I watched it right after it came out. I need season four now. I'm assuming it got renewed. Did it get renewed for season four? Um, I feel like I had heard something about it, like maybe being in danger of not being renewed. But I don't know if that was like actual, you know, fact or if it was just sort of a, a sense that people were circulating. Um, Jan says the subreddit said ghost Nandor was speaking Farsi. I have no way to confirm though. Really? That isn't what I would have expected. Like, I wouldn't think that it would be the same language as any language used in present day. I was assuming it would be like a, a language that had long since been forgotten, you know, but that's kind of cool. How old is Farsi? I've never like looked into this in any way. Um, but that's kind of rad. Hmm. Well, thank you, Jan. Um, all right, everybody. Well, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you very much to Max for commissioning this and for your patience, Max, and letting me reschedule because I was pretty sick <laughs> last week. Um, you can still kind of hear it in my voice, but I, uh, 
I had to move a bunch of things to this week. So I really appreciate everybody rolling with me on that one. And hopefully, let's see, when is the next one? Let me just check this. Next one is Friday, March 4th. So not too far from now um, with the next episode. So I'm looking forward to it. All right, guys, until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.